Good morning, UCY.TV radio listeners. This is Lonnie Clark with the Age of Vision radio show. And I have the really great honor of uh, interviewing Libby Halevi with uh, Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you so much for being with us. I really appreciate your efforts. Um, you know, many of our listeners have are a big fan of your radio show already, and we know that you are a survivor of the Three Mile Island Hot Seat. My first and primary question is, have you been an activist since you were in, in that um, accident? I mean, how long have you been actively engaged? Because your work, it seems like you have a body of knowledge that is long and deep, and I really value it. Well, thank you for your kind uh, words I, I, about that. And as to whether I was an activist from Three Mile Island on, no. As a matter of fact, I was the opposite of an activist. Once I got back from Middletown, I didn't live there. I was visiting a friend who just happened to live one mile away, and I just happened to arrive five days beforehand. Uh, and we did not evacuate until the third day when there were already the – uh, vehicles going down the street with the loudspeakers saying, stay indoors, keep your doors and windows closed, do not go outside unless you have to, and uh, which was pretty terrifying. It was existential. It was, do I still exist? Has there already been so much radiation that I don't know whether I'm going to survive this or not? Because I'm old enough that I grew up during the Cold War, and I remember all the radiation propaganda and nuclear propaganda about how horrible it was and what it would do to our bodies, except we were expecting it to come from the Russians. We were not expecting it to come from our own government-sanctioned facilities that we have plopped in our backyards all over the country. Um. So... From the time that I was able to get back to Los Angeles, I spent a brief time attempting to be an activist, but to be completely honest, I had so much post-traumatic stress before we actually knew what that term was. We weren't calling it that. I was just freaked out. I was a mess. Um, could not concentrate, could not work. I was indulging in both behaviors and substances that are usually the subject of 12-step meetings, except I wasn't going to any meetings. <laughs> and, okay. and basically anything that popped up that reminded me of Three Mile Island, if I saw something on a bumper sticker, if I saw a picture of the oh. cooling towers, anything like that, it would flash me back to a particular instance when I was alone in that house and didn't know if I was going to survive long enough to take my next breath. So with that much stress on me, I took a trip and then I ended up leaving the country for the better part of six months. I did not come back until about a year and a half after Three Mile Island, at which point I just determined that I wasn't going to pay any attention to it. It had nothing to do with my life, when indeed it had an enormous amount to do with my life. Um, one of the major aspects being that because I did not know how much radiation I had been exposed to, because nobody ever got an accurate read on that, because the equipment didn't work. By the way, I used to think that the equipment didn't work at Three Mile Island because it was supplied by the lowest bidder, and therefore it just it broke. It was like a thermostat and it broke. I didn't understand that the radiation levels were so high that they fried the meters. They went off chart and oh basically busted. I only found that out about two years ago from some research I was finally brave enough to do. But I absolutely ignored all things nuclear. When Chernobyl happened, I ignored that because in my mind, oh, look, everybody's running around being afraid of nuclear. I've already been afraid of nuclear. I know what that's like. I don't have to experience that again. And I turned off the TV set. I turned off the radio. I didn't read newspaper reports. I wouldn't engage in a conversation. Nothing. For me, it was like, eh, in there, done that. And wow. I maintained that set of blinders. See, I can understand why people aren't paying attention to nuclear because they can ignore it for the most part until it is not possible to ignore it. And when Fukushima happened, I like to say that Three Mile Island mule kicked me out of the life that I had been living up to that point. 
Fukushima mule kicked me back into it. From the instant I found out there was nuclear involvement, which was only about two hours after I found out about the earthquake and the tsunami, which were horrible, tragic incidents in their own right. But as soon as I found out that there was a nuclear facility that had been perhaps compromised, it wasn't known at that point, but perhaps compromised, it was like some switch flipped on in me that had been turned off a long time before, and I became obsessed with watching it. I mean, I put my computer next to my bed, and every time I turned over in some very disturbed sleep, I would Google again to find out exactly what was going on. And because of the background of the Cold War and knowing what radiation does, and because of my experience at Three Mile Island, at that time, I probably knew more than the average person about what the dangers were and what we were up against, which is why I was so obsessed. And I actually started reporting on it two days after it happened because I was scheduled to do a podcast for a storytelling group of mine. And to their surprise, instead of reading a very sweet story I had written about re-meeting my first boyfriend after 30 years, I improvised off the top of my head this babble about what was going on at Fukushima and Three Mile Island and all the rest. I don't think they were happy with that because they wanted my nice, sweet little story. But from that point on, it became just about the only thing that I could talk about. And I became committed to finding ways to share what it is that I understood about what was happening at a time when the people who did understand, those who had been in the movement, were not accessible to me because I hadn't been part of the movement. I was just an individual out there. And I had to, in a way, swim my way upstream to get back in with the people who I now consider to be my tribe. Wow. Wow, that's an incredible story. I mean, you know, did you think when uh, Fukushima happened ever in your mind that we would be talking about it four years later that they would just ignore it and let it go for so long? It is so uh, uh, incomprehensible to me. I never once in my wildest dreams, I, I, I have to say that's probably the one thing that drives me the most in this, is just the realization that our government is not telling us the truth. This simply, they are simply misleading people. Like, I think about those poor people that are in St. Louis right now, just struggling to be acknowledged that they are living in danger. That is just, to me, a crime against humanity. All of nuclear, to me, is a crime against humanity, starting with Trinity and Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and then everything that has been done since that time. Yeah. And you asked me whether I was expecting it to be this stamped down. I have a broadcasting background. That was my first degree. I worked for WGN, WGBH. I've been a broadcaster on various radio, radio stations. And so I know how the media operates. But I was still, at the time that Fukushima happened, I was kind of like, you know, a middle-of-the-road liberal. I was far liberal left on human rights issues and on human freedom issues. But for the rest of it, you know, I voted and that was about it. But the awarenesses that have come to me in just watching this story unfold and the suppression of it is actually, for me, a bigger story than right. the story it's what's happening because it was like the pieces of and I'm not quote unquote a conspiracy theorist and blah 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 by the way that was a phrase that was invented to deny the truth that people were putting together on various subjects but it's not about conspiracy it's about the fact that people with a lot of money and a lot of power didn't want information getting out and from the start the pressure was on for example for the first four days after Fukushima began, and I don't say when Fukushima happened, that puts it in the past tense, it's still going on. It's still happening right now. But for about the first four days on the news reports, they were talking about the plume of airborne radiation that was traveling through the jet stream and through the atmosphere and was scheduled to hit the west coast of North America eight days after Fukushima began, meaning approximately March 19 or 20, depending on how you calculated the time. 
And I was watching the stories every day. And as of the fifth day, the entire plume story disappeared. The word plume didn't appear. There was no awareness. There was no tracking in the mainstream as to what was happening. And there were words that disappeared from discourse. Um, I have a lot of contact in a lot of different places in the media. And one person told me that a reporter for, and this was an NPR station, was called in with all the other reporters and news people, and they were told that they were expressly forbidden from using the word fallout. Oh, they could wow. not use... You could use the word fallout if, you know, Anthony Weiner had a picture of his Weiner on his cell phone and and there was political fallout. But you couldn't talk about radiation fallout because that's a word, this is my read on it, I'm, I pay a lot of attention to the languaging. Um, Fallout is a word that is associated with the 50 and the bomb tests. When you say fallout, well, like fear, because that's programmed into the word. So pressure was placed at very high levels, and I don't have confirmation on how this took place, but I have at least one plausible story, and I'm hoping to get confirmation at some point. But pressure was placed on broadcasters to eliminate certain aspects of the story, certain parts of the vocabulary, and to downplay Fukushima because the major concern was to manage the panic of certainly the American people. I can't speak for what was happening in other countries. I know a little bit about Japan, but I was really watching the United States, and I watched the story evaporate. Do you think that they are really... I See, I don't think that... It's kind of like what's happening in St. Louis. The panic, there is no panic. This is the biggest shock to me. This is the, what I, why I, on my show, The Age of Vision, I really focus a lot, and I speak about this often, is about the social engineering. I am dumbfounded that people will accept the fact that their eight-month-old child gets cancer without asking, why is my child getting cancer? You know, we have babies born with cancer. Mm-hmm. It is, I think, in part because if you look at it through a certain lens, radiation is diabolical. You can't sense it with any of your senses. You can't see it, smell it, touch it, taste it. It is something that can impact your body at from the lowest level on up, though there are battles being fought right now. We can get into this about how our perception of radiation is now being manipulated. That's the current battleground. But yes. it, takes, it takes a period of time between, unless it's a catastrophic dose that cannot be ignored, and even then it can be spun. I have an example of that. But from exposure to manifestation can take three to five years at the earliest for, for uh, thyroid cancer or leukemia, can take 10, 12, 15 years at the earliest for hard tumors to show up, and then it continues for the rest of your life because you've been exposed, it's done what it's done to your body. And, of course, the genetic impact, you may not have something that shows up as an immediate impact on your life, especially if one happens to be older and was born before there was a lot of radiation in the environment, as I was. Um, so we might survive just fine. But there's no telling the damage that has been done to our DNA and how that gets passed on to children and the diseases that that is implicit in. So in going back to situations like St. Louis, which I've been covering very extensively on Nuclear Hot Seat, I've been doing interviews just about every week, um, on some aspect of what's going on there. Uh, if your listeners are not familiar or if you happen to be new, it's a Manhattan Project World War II era pile of 42,000 tons of radioactive waste illegally buried in an unlined pit in a landfill, which by itself is bad enough because it has been migrating for years into the environment, into Coldwater Creek, which runs through residential neighborhoods and adjacent to parks and all the like. Not only that, not only has it been kicked up in the dust, but since December of 2010, there's been an underground fire burning from an adjacent landfill that they can't stop because it's 
chemical, and I don't understand all the technicalities, but it's like the peat fires that sometimes happen in Ireland where they will burn for decades because there's no way to put them out. This is a chemical fire, and it has been encroaching on the radiologic waste. And as of an announcement that was made by the first responders in the area about four or five weeks ago, it is that the fire is within a quarter of a mile of the radioactive waste. Imagine three football fields. It's a little bit less, and that's what it was like a month ago. And wow. they are estimating that that the fire will intersect with this radioactive waste. At the time, they said three to six months. What we're looking at now is two to five months. So basically, sometime in January is a time when we might be facing the fire, you know, the rubber hitting the road, the fire hitting the nuclear waste. And nobody has the slightest idea what to do about the fire, what to do about the waste. EPA just step in to try and manage panic and say, oh, there's no danger here without, as somebody put it on my show this week, as Karen Nickel, who is one of the activists down there, put it on the show this week, EPA has not been on the radiologic site. They have not so much as put a shovel in the ground. All they've done is shovel their propaganda to tell people it's no danger and the fire is not going in that direction, to which I add, and by the way, the dog ate my homework. You know, I read something, it was an old document in which they, the company who owns the site actually asked the EPA for permission to remediate it, and they said that it had grown grass, and so they figured that it was okay. It was a, such a shock that they actually had this, ad, they treat the nuclear waste as if it is just normal waste. You know, their attitude is that the nuclear waste doesn't require a separate set of decisions. It's incomprehensible to me. It's part of the propaganda because the money involved is so great and the people who are making the money are so short-sighted. Either that or they know some secret technology for giving themselves immunity to radiation. But I'm not betting on that one. I don't think Nikola's test, Nikola Tesla came up with that. I don't think anybody's come up with that. And I think these people are living in a sociopathic or psychotic bubble that they think they can get away with this. Either that or they think that, you know, well, you know, the person who dies with the most toys wins and I don't have to worry about future generations because they're not me. I mean, these are people who are seriously shut off. Do you, do you believe that, uh, see, this is what I'm thinking. I think that they genuinely believe that it's not that bad, that they really believe that radiation, is, they must believe that radiation is just not that bad for you. That's the only way that I think that, in my head, like, they're ignoring something that is quite catastrophic. Uh, I heard Don Chapman on your radio show, in fact, say that, both her children were born with genetic defects, or three of her children, all of her children. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is directly related to the nuclear issue. And there is actually no, this is the biggest crime, there's no acknowledgement of that by anybody in charge. They act as if it's really not that big of a deal if we get children who have genetic birth defects. They I, don't dare acknowledge it. The hit on the insurance agency, the lawsuits, the panic, the demands. It would be catastrophic to the power structure that has given enormous amounts of money, for example, to Barack Obama's two campaigns. His major donors were out of, or his major donor was out of the nuclear industry. All these small towns that have a nuclear reactor where it is the major employer in the area, there's tremendous pressure through the Chamber of Commerce and like we're not going to talk about anything going wrong there because it will hurt the economy. But, you know, the economy, money is not going to save people from what gets done to their physical bodies as a result of exposure to this. And once you've been exposed, you can never not be exposed to it. You, there are steps that can be taken to help strengthen the body and to help detoxify the body, but you will never go back to that state neutrality of not being exposed. And quite frankly, at this point, I don't know if there are people on this planet who have not been exposed to radiation from the bomb test, from what came down from the... Uh, 
uh, from the jet stream in rain and, and snow, from the radiation that is still up there from the atmospheric tests. Um, you know, there are, people have said to me, well, where do you go? And the answer is, there really is no place. Right. There re- I mean, you can get away, but you never know what you're getting yourself into. For example, those people in St. Louis moved to what they thought was this nice residential, right. quiet, out-of-the-city neighborhood, not knowing what was right there. And quite frankly, where I live is not far from the Santa Susana Field Laboratory, which was the site of a Rocketdyne experimental reactor meltdown of 13 fuel rods back in 1959 in right. an uncontained, you know, so they just let that stuff out. And, I've been right. and, and actually, they, you know what, I know about that because I'm from Los Angeles. This friend of mine and I, when we got involved in the Fukushima awareness thing, this whole thing, he actually, because he's from Van Nuys, his mother, his father, his brother, his two of his brothers and his sister all died from cancer, all of them. And we dug out some reports, and we read this report that the government actually allowed an 18-year-old to make a decision whether to release the radiation into the air or not. An 18-year-old had to make that decision. Well, I'm sure that the chain of command pushed it as far down. If they could have given it to a janitor, they would have. (laughs) That's actually probably true, Libby. That's probably true. You know, when it it comes to nuclear, uh, I had an interviewee, uh, I think it was two weeks ago, uh, Byron DeLear is one of the activists. He's also uh, running for for office down in the North St. Louis area. But he Mm -hmm. talked about the nuclear hot potato. And truly it is. It's a radioactive hot potato because if they admit to how bad it is, every place they've been lying about it, people are going to be forced out of their denial and forced to face it. And there will be rage. There will be panic. I know what I went through, even with Three Mile Island in my background, even with having gone through the Cold War. Fukushima led me on a journey and nuclear hot seat has led me on a journey to some ugly realization about the genuine nature of the power structure in this country and how it doesn't care for us. It doesn't care for me. And I think that's one of the hardest things to give up because anyone who comes in the pathway of this issue and tries to get justice, tries to get remediation, tries to get action, tries to get anything suddenly discovers for themselves the hard way that systemically this government does not do what America is supposed to do, which is to protect its people, help us nurture ourselves to good lives. We have become a mean, angry, money-obsessed, hating, vision-suppressing country that will do anything to preserve its economy at at the risk of life and health. Right, it's, and it's money over it's money over people. It's very clear, money over people. A hundred percent. They have no. We are assets. In fact, people are considered assets. We're not considered. There's no dignity. There's no human respect. If there were, so you know, really, what the government needs to do is apologize. I mean, that's the interesting thing. If they had any integrity, they would just draw a line in the sand and say, okay, this is the reality. We've made some pretty grave mistakes, but we're going to hold hands and work through this together, and we're going to be honest and we're going to address your needs. And not everybody's needs are going to be addressed. That's the real sad issue. It's it's so catastrophic. It's so big. Not everybody is going to be helped. And it, it, it is really unconscionable. And you're right. People need feel like my own children, they don't want to think about it. But, you know, what's funny is my daughter said to me, because I got off of Facebook, I got very sick of the hating on Facebook, and she said, you know, Mom, if you don't post on Facebook, my friends don't see your post. They don't comment, but they're all talking about it. They all know it's real. That's so important, and especially the young kids, because this is their legacy. We have traded 70 years of 
the illusion of, of cheap energy, which it is absolutely not. We have traded 70 years of the nuclear lies and the nuclear sociopathy and psychopathy for the genetic future of our children, and I say that inclusively because I will take that position as well, at least right. not from my right. body, but they're my kids too. Yeah. And yeah. that that doesn't end. It continues on. And we do not know how even the current levels of exposure are going to play out through the generation. Well, yeah, That's the really, scary and we, well, I think we do know what's going to happen. I mean, we're going to have a really reduced population. We know that it causes sterility, if not this generation, the next and the next. My friend, Louise but look at the there. but look at the number of people who have to go to in vitro fertilization now. They're not True. making the connection that maybe IVF is connected True. with you got exposed to some radiation. It's like. Is the autism epidemic that's happening to our children, is that related yeah. to it? What yeah, about it's, it's, allergy, weird allergies? Peanut butter and jelly used to be a staple for kids. Now peanut butter kills. How did that right. happen? Right. And it's right. not that, that radiation is the only aspect of this, but the one thing that is never talked about, that is never included in the equation, is radiation. That's actually so true, Vivi. That's so true. They really don't. My own sister lives right next door to Three Mile Island. She had uh, ah. seven children. Yes, she grew up right in uh, what's it called? Uh, that little Milltown. Town. No, it's not Milltown. Milltown. It's, Har it's Harrisburg. I guess it's called Harrisburg. Yeah, Harrisburg's a little bit larger. It's a little further away, but yeah, Harrisburg's right there. Yeah, but she, and she actually like. But she's moving now straight to near Three Mile Island. Her daughter lives up there. And, you know, she has t two of her children have autistic children. The other two of her children have, they have some kind of learning disabilities. And I said to her, you know, it's probably from living near the radiation. She's like, well, it's, it, probably, it comes from everything. Who knows? It's probably from their family history. They probably have this and they never knew it. And that's what the nuclear liars depend on. They depend on us blaming ourselves, blaming our genetics, and not, you know, like accepting that this has just got to happen. It's, it's about as yeah, Yes, it is. And as regards Three Mile Island, are you familiar with the work of Joe Mangano, who does epidemiological studies yeah, of different yeah. areas? Okay. Yeah. He did a study about Three Mile Island and discovered that the highest rate of, oh, I should probably look this up, but it's the highest rate of either leukemia or thyroid cancer in the country is within 50 miles of Three Mile Island. The highest in the country. Wow. Wow. Okay invisible because he had to go in and tease that information out from existing statistics because getting that kind of research funded doesn't happen because what's in it for anybody to do that research other than to follow their own nest for any further funds for research so no school is going to back it you know we well, need some we need we need some hollywood millionaires and billionaires to say okay let me crowdfund this piece of research. Let's find out what's going on over there. Let's somehow put a little bit of money into the bake sale budget that has been funding this movement, this anti-nuclear movement, this movement for nuclear conscience, for God's sake, for nuclear responsibility. That's the thing that our government is not doing. We're not taking responsibility for anything. It's kind of, oh, it's that guy over there. Oh, well, I was forced to. Oh, you know, the devil made me do it. Yeah. They make it. Nobody steps forward and takes responsibility. There's no place where the buck stops. Yeah, well, that's the Price-Anderson Act, isn't it? I mean, that's really, at least in our country, that's what we have with the Price-Anderson Act. Nobody's responsible. That's And that's like, did you see the hearing last month with Barbara Boxer? They did an oversight of the NRC. And evidently, in the last few months, the NRC has approved uh, Southern California Edison's to request to not have an emergency plan. They are not required mm -hmm. now to have an emergency plan. And the head of the NRC, Mr. Burns, actually literally said, 
Well, we felt it was too heavy of a burden because all of our plants are only designed for plants that are in operation. And San Onofre is not in operation, so we felt it would be an unlikely burden. Barbara Boxer split a gut at that hearing, but that's the, uh, this, this is a person who's actually saying, I, when I was watching this man say these words, I'm like, how can he possibly say those words that the risk, of an earthquake in California is so low that they thought it was too heavy of a burden? Uh, They're not acknowledging the radiation danger posed by all those spent fuel rods which are jammed into into the spent fuel pools. And I hate calling them spent because that means, oh, they're dead, they're flat, they're over. Right. No, uh right. Every one of them contains weapons-grade plutonium. And now what Southern California Edison is attempting to do with the NRC's complete approval and backing. We can talk about federal agencies and what they actually do, which is nothing on behalf of the people. But with the NRC's backing and approval, they are planning to buy for dry cask storage the absolute cheapest tin can, thin canisters possible that yeah. have no means of being repaired, no means of taking monitoring of what's going on inside, and they're only five-eighths of an inch of, of metal, of steel. That's the only thing that is shielding them. And that steel is vulnerable to corrosion from the sea environment. Donna Gilmore with SanOnofreSafety.org has got lots of reports on this if people yeah. want to check up on it. Yeah, she does. She yeah. does phenomenal work, and this is her all is dangerous. Really a, it's true. Her website is a treasure trove of information, and actually, I believe that those casts are being used throughout our country. Those half-inch casts, like there's one up here at the that's leaking. We know it's leaking up at the Columbia Generating Station, but the uh, utility is telling us, well. It's just a small leak. We don't think it's affecting ah. anything. So when it becomes a problem, then they're going to deal with it. I mean, it is You know, and nobody ever defines where do we cross the line from it's not a problem to a problem. It's like when they use the word significant. Oh, there's no significant danger. Would you please give me a number for that? What, what is the numeric difference between significant and not significant? What's the percentage? Exactly. Who draws that line? Who gets to determine that? It's like when they say, well, there's no immediate danger. In truth, they're right. There's no immediate danger, but three to five right. years leukemia and thyroid cancer, 10, 12, 15 and onward, hard cancers. In, you know, in Westlake, in the, in the, in the uh, Coldwater Creek area in North St. Louis, they have something over 40 cases of appendix cancer. Nobody's ever even heard of appendix cancer but they've got right. appendix cancer in a cluster there, you know. And what's interesting is that I truly believe that what is happening in North St. Louis and the diligence of the activists there, especially the moms groups, my God, there's nothing more ferocious than a mom whose children are being threatened. They have, as of today, I don't know if you caught the news, but both senators from the state of Missouri and all but four of the representatives in the House of Representatives have together gone to Congress, gone to our government, and said, you got to do something about this, and you've got to do this now. Great. And Good. This, is un this is unprecedented because, of course, the four who backed out were all Republicans, but be that as it may, um, the fact that they are bringing this up, they want the entire program to be put under a program that already, uh, the entire problem, under a program that already exists, which is called FOOSRAP. And I can't give you what the acronym stands for, but it's basically a, a program specifically for remediating radioactive sites with material left over from the Manhattan Project that is right. in the St. Louis area. I mean, that's what it's intended for. And the reason that this hasn't been remediated is that the site well, at the, the waste was bought by a company that went bankrupt that was bought by a company that went bankrupt that was bought by a company. It went several steps down. And suddenly they're kind of going, oh, not my hot potato, it's somebody else's hot potato. And nobody has stepped forward. And meanwhile, we've got this risk happening. And we could lose St. Louis over this. We could, we have no idea 
what's going to happen and how bad it could be. I, for one, don't want to wait around to find out. We need action. We need it now. And the fact that there has been nothing coming top down, I think, is, is an outrage. I think it is a shame. I think it is damning of the humanity of those people who are supposed to be in a position of taking care of the well-being of the American people, at least that's in theory, from President Obama on down, that Gina never met a nuke I didn't meet, I didn't like in cover for McCarthy, that's her full name to me, who's the head of the EPA. These people deserve to be shamed for what they have allowed to happen. Gina McCarthy was approached two, at least two years ago. The EPA was approached at least two years ago saying, could we put this under foos wrap so that something can be done? And they've just been picking their noses and kicking it down the road. Well, there's no more road left. And I want to see heads roll. I want Gina McCarthy canned. I want her out. Well, I well, want Obama to, to get to off his honest, butt and pay attention to what's fact, happening in this country. He, he is not. And, in fact, when I heard that that uh, the EPA was in, t in the head of, uh, the whole thing out there at St. Louis, it kind of made sense about why they picked Gina McCarthy. That kind of, that actually really made sense why they would pick her to do that. Like, why did she actually leave the NRC? They, they knew, they knew what this, they, this, none of this is an accident. This is intentional. It's almost, it's like a battered, when I say we live in the battered wives culture, we do, we, our country is like battered. We live, you know, there's no battered, there's no battered culture shelter to go to. We have got to take it back from them. But the re the reality is, you know, we we really don't have much options except for us to stick through it and keep and press on because honestly, it is unconscionable what they are doing with our planet right now. It's just, it's beyond unconscionable. I just, I, I, mm -hmm. I'm just blown away by it. To be honest, I, I just can't get over it. And my particular rage is that I was trained as a journalist back in an era where it was an honorable profession, when Edward R. Murrow was still alive, when Walter Cronkite was the most trusted man in America, when CBS had a real powerhouse news department, and news was honorable because that's what it was reported. That's what they did. They reported what was happening. And there's an old saying that comes from a newsman from around the turn of the century, H.L. Mencken. He said, the purpose of journalism is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. <laughs> it is. Oh, yeah. No, that, that one's there. Oh, oh, it's like way, you're supposed to. Go ahead. I'm sorry. What journalism is supposed to do is look at the hard stories and tell the hard truths. And right. it's been tremendously c compromised by the corporate takeovers. My rage is with those reporters who have fallen for it, who are not fighting back. I mean, there's still people out there like, you know, Amy Goodman, like, um, oh, my apologies right now, I'm not remembering the, 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 the uh, man, the men who do, who I know, I know the men from it, from uh, Project Censored, uh, Tom Hartman on RT.com. Right. I mean, the real reporters are getting marginalized in ways that they can be ignored. But for those sources, for those stations, the independent stations, that have the power still to determine what they are putting on the air, where are the reporters? I keep saying, anytime I come in contact with reporters, and there's actually a, 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 a not a seminar, a, uh, God, I'm blanking on the word, a conference. A conference that happens once a year called Excellence in Journalism that has more than a 1,000 reporters and news editors and uh, news directors from all over the country and actually some of them from Central and South America as well who gather together in one point to discuss their issues. I was able to attend once when I was a, a few years ago when it was here in Los Angeles. In 2017, it's going to be in Los Angeles. I want to get there again in 2016 because these people have to be reached and have to be made aware of the story. What I tell them all is there are Pulitzers hidden in this story. 
I don't care where you are. I don't care if you're with ESPN. You can always cover what's going on to cover up Fukushima. Yeah, but you, you know what? This goes back to Amy Goodman's 90% rule, right? Like, it's the 90% rule. Let me, you know, I always talk about the 90% rule. John Gottman studied the people of Hiroshima and Nagasaki for 20 years. And at the end of his study, he came up with a scientific report that said the uh, nuclear industry and the U.S. military underreport the negative effects of radiation by 90% and deny radiation causes harm. They have stuck with that program since the beginning. But the thing with Amy Goodman, it's very interesting because she's actually said, well, at least she can read. Because I've written email back and forth, you know, as I've watched her show, and I've gotten very frustrated about the coverage because I think she's softballed it. Like she, she allows people to believe that it is not an ongoing catastrophe by the, her reporting. And she said, well, at least we can get 90% of the information in. That's better than getting nothing because with the nuclear industry, they run the media in our country. So big, 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 uh, you know, the big corporations are not going to allow people on there at all. Well, then we have to find the small independently owned stations. There's a... um, relatively small chain of stations that owns King 5, the NBC station in Seattle. And that's home base for Susanna Frame, who has done such brilliant and oh. now award-winning investigative coverage of Hanford and Columbia Generating Station. I mean, that she has sense. been... She is... And I interviewed her for Nuclear Hopsy, and she was a little bit shocked when I told her that she was the only television reporter in the country, the only investigative television reporter in the country who was dedicated, given a dedicated assignment to cover the nuclear side of the issue. And she, at the time that she was asked to look into Hanford, which was only about four months before I interviewed her, she had never done a nuclear story in her life. This is all information that she came across and chased down and followed up on in the last about two and a half years now since we first talked. So, so but that's I, what it takes. It takes some gutsy local station that yeah. is not beholden to one of these humongous conglomerates yeah. to take the bit in their teeth and actually cover it. Or, as it's turning out now, CBS National. They're doing the best job in the country in covering St. Louis after nuclear hot seat. And why why do you think that they are the why do you think they have a particular interest? Because I that's fascinating that you tell me it's a small locally owned station in the northwest, but how is it that CBS, a big a big corporation, is interested in, in St. Louis? Why do you think that is? I haven't a clue and I would love to know. Clearly, in to my thinking, it could be that somebody on their in an important position in their news department. We're not talking some reporter. We're yeah. talking somebody other than that either has family in St. Louis or has personal uh, experience with the uh-huh. issue, or, or they're calling on the ghost of Edward R. Murrow to come forward because Murrow's the man who took down McCarthy. I think St. Louis can take down the entire international, well, not na- international, the entire national nuclear cabal that has become embedded in the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, in the EPA, and in the Food and Drug Administration because they're not paying attention to what's happening with the food. Those are the big three. I think this story is cannot be shut off. It cannot be shut down. The fact that CBS National had another story about what the uh, legislators, the two senators and I believe it was ten representatives, did today on Capitol Hill. We've got a real ally there. And this is the first time we have had that in the national media. Somebody is either going rogue or somebody's just got a really big stick that they that they can lash out at or somebody very high up has said, this is now personal. Go for it. You've got my full backing. Maybe they just saw the film Spotlight, which is about how the Boston Globe unveiled and revealed the entirety and the enormity and the horror of the priests, the, the, the pedophile Catholic priests. 
Maybe they're hearkening back to all the president's men. We're two reporters from the Washington Post with the backing of Ben Bradley and, and Ka- Catherine Graham were able to take, a, take down a president. We don't know how far this is going, but at this point, St. Louis is the story and maybe the fulcrum that will ultimately take down Everything nuclear, because it's all there from Manhattan Project to the dirty little secret of the nuclear industry, and that is the radioactive waste. Right. It's the waste. It's the, and, you know, the, the doctors, I mean, the people that are engaged that have been lied to essentially for the last 70 years, the professionals who have been told that it's safe. And this new idea of hormesis is horrendous, and it's going to be very interesting. What do you, how do you think the NRC is going to rule on this hormesis theory? You know, today was the oh, ending of the I, I, oh, I, can t- I can tell you. I can tell you. Okay. Anytime, <laughs> good, the word hormesis, anytime the word hormesis comes up, as listeners of nuclear hot seat will know, I will also say, no, hormesis, because that's what you are if you believe this radiation-denying Junk, I don't even want to call it junk science because I don't want to dirty the word science in proximity with it. What it is is flat-out pro-nuclear propaganda. It's the same as when survivors of sexual abuse, which is another group that I belong to, survivors of sexual abuse started suing their perpetrators, and suddenly from out of the middle of nowhere came a well-funded program called False Memory Syndrome, as in, well, you're not remembering what you say you're remembering. And unfortunately, that took hold, that worked its way through, and now people believe, oh, you're really not remembering, or a therapist put that in your mind, or, oh, you got that through hypnosis. Not understanding at all how the memory process works when confronted with trauma. And it's the exact same model they are following. Let's introduce what we're calling is an absolutely... it's an, exactly. They're calling it an absolutely equal science, you know, so that if you mention linear no threshold, which is the gold standard that says that any exposure to radiation is dangerous, it's why pregnant women don't get x-rays. Or if they need to have their teeth x-rayed, they wear a full lead shield on their body. Well, if a little radiation is good for you, why is it that it was pre I mean, there's all this evidence, but we lack persistence of vision in this country. We it, don't it's not remember. Just, it, it, it's not just that. This is what I mean. This is why I always come back to the social programming. It is so deeply embedded in our culture, like, oh, they use this. They say it's not radiation, it's something else. I mean, we have a cacophony of toxins in our environment, and it's like they get to finger point at the other. It's like those fire. It's kind of like that little joke that's in that book that John Goffman wrote, you know, the lighter side of nuclear power. I forget, an irreverent guide to nuclear energy or something like that. There was a little cartoon with these all these executives sitting around the boardroom and the, the CEOs looking at the executives saying, well, folks, he's like, well, guys, it was the first thing we have to do is convince everybody that good health just isn't what it's cut out to be. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I don't know that book. I've got to get a copy of it. Oh, I'll get it for you. It's a really great, you know, I read on my uh, YouTube channel. Right now I'm reading the book Poisoned Power by John Goffman because people have forgotten the real science and I decided I'm going to start reading his books. And so I have a playlist on my YouTube outlined how this whole idea that the NRC says no immediate danger to health, you know how that came about? He said this is basically it. They don't look at it. They conduct studies so that they don't have to look at the exposure. He said it, he gave this analogy. It was a perfect analogy. It's as if a thousand people were in a stadium. The lights went out for five minutes, and somebody got stabbed to death. And when the lights came back on, the NRC would say nobody died because we didn't see it. Oh, good one. That's how they do it. That's how they operate completely. They say we didn't see it because it has not been observed. No observable negative events. You get what I'm saying? Like this is, they do this intentionally. It is not an accident. It's an intentional deception. 
Well, you know, the whole thing about exposure to radiation and nobody died at Fukushima and all that crap that they're putting out. I mean, Masao Yoshida is a man to whom probably the entire planet owes their lives. He was a plant manager at Fukushima, one who rallied the Fukushima 50 and stayed there and poured water on the plant to keep it as cool as possible because it was heating up. And he was actually, the day after the accident, he was contacted by phone by um, by TEPCO officials in Tokyo saying, what do you mean you're pouring seawater on the, uh, on the reactors? You can damage them that way. Cut it out. And he said, you have no, no idea what's going on here. He stayed with it. Well, about within two years, I think it was, I'm not sure exactly, but around two years after, um, after that happened, Yoshida died of esophageal cancer. TEPCO actually had the goal to say, well, it couldn't have been related to Fukushima because it takes longer than that for that kind of cancer to develop. I recall you know? that story. How outrageous was that? That was the most offensive. This man gave his life for our, the world and his country, and for them to deny it was, to me, so, so, so shameful. It was unbelievable. Right, but that's what they do. It's It's either... Oh, well, it showed up too quick. This is what they're saying about the sailors on the USS Ronald Reagan who were directly in line of the plume when they were just all up the water on board is, is seawater that is then desalinated. So they were just taking that and it was in the air and they had no protection. You know, Kepco is saying, oh, well, no, that can't possibly be from Fukushima. They all must have been sick beforehand because it takes longer than that for radiation illness for some of these show up if you've been exposed. You know, you can't win with these people. So all you can do is a full frontal assault with as much information, pushing as hard as we can against those right. people who still have some power against them to get something done. Because appealing to conscience will not work. Appealing to common sense and logic will not work. They are there to demolish logic and common sense. That's what the pro-nukers want to do so that well, we can't even have that. a lot. You know, when do you think, what do you think the NRC will do about this hormesis thing? Do you think that they're going to approve the hormesis theory, or do you think they're going to reject that? Oh, if they have any way of accepting that, then they're going to go for it. And if the temperature is still a little too hot around it, they will send it to some committee for further study. But they're going to keep that puppy alive because that gets them off the hook across the board. If we do not understand what radiation is, what it does, how dangerous it is, that turning that around, they then have a basis for saying from that point forward, which they're already using, saying, oh, but it's not dangerous. It's not that much. It's just a little radiation. A little radiation is good for you. Without, I mean, Dr. Ian Fairley, He's another really wonderful source. It's and he, his website is Ian Fairley, I A N F like Frank A I R L I E dot org. The British researcher did a brilliant dissection of hormesis and why it is it's it's junk. And he's got like pages of footnotes on it. It's only an eleven page document, and I think about a third of it is footnotes for the sources that he cites as to why linear no threshold is the gold standard and why hormesis is radiation denying junk. But it's propaganda well, and propaganda is useful for the EPA people who have it. I read that the EPA scientist came out and said he doesn't believe in the hormesis theory. He thinks that that's an incorrect position to take. So I thought that was well, really encouraging. Well, that's one voice. And what is the, what are the odds that we're ever going to hear from him again under the aegis of the NRC? Yeah, you're probably right you on know, that. You know, I mean, it was like, fortunately, there are, but here's what I find so encouraging. More and more, there are people who are inside the system who have seen what's going on, who have been outraged, who have been worried, and they are coming forward. Word is leaking out. Just like they cannot fix a leak on a whole tech dry cast thin canister, tin can canister for storing uh, radi radiologic waste from nuclear reactors. Just as they cannot stop a leak there, they cannot stop the leaks from coming out from all these nuclear sites because the people who see the truth and who know the truth have been frustrated too long and are feeling such a sense of desperation as to how bad it is 
that they who still have a conscience, who still have an ethical basis, who still have empathy, who still have a conscience, are not remaining quiet. They're finding ways to speak out. They're finding ways to get their information. They will find the reporters. They will find the anti-nuclear organization. They will find the individuals who are capable of listening to them and keeping their information sacrosanct so that it can be shared. There you go. We have a little bit left, and, uh, you know, I really thank you for joining me and our listeners today on this uh, radio show, and I really appreciate it. Your website is nuclearhotseat.com. Uh, you have a podcast every week that everybody should listen to. It is a tre treasure trove of information week after week. As they can hear in this last hour, you ha are an incredible source of information. Oh, goodness. Thank you. And I appreciate you getting me on this show. We have great conversations offline, too. I, mean, yeah. <laughs> I, think, really you, I awesome. think you are a treasure as well. This is, well, this I, is the start I, of a beautiful friendship. I hope so.